Hi and welcome back to this week's episode on Amplify. My name is Sanchi Singh and this week I'm looking into the world of chocolate. Now, chocolate has undergone this journey from being an item that merely satisfies one's sweet tooth or craving to being consumed for its various health benefits. Chocolatiers are tapping into this evolving consumer palette and demand and the industry is set to grow exponentially year on year. But the dark side of chocolate, if you will, is that it is an industry rife with child slavery and deforestation. While the chocolate industry has largely lined up behind commitments to eradicate these, the complexities of indirect supply chains pose a significant challenge. In this episode, I look at a homegrown enterprise based in Mysore that works with local suppliers and farmers to source cocoa beans for their bean to bar chocolate. We talk about the challenges of the industry, why India was a suitable choice for them when a majority of cocoa is sourced from Ivory Coast and Ghana, and hitting the sweet spot between sustainability and scalability. Part of the pun. Fair warning, for the purposes of this episode, you might want to have a bar handy to nibble on. Welcome to this week's episode on Amplify. Today I'm joined by David Bello, who is the founder of Navi Luna Artisan Chocolate based in Mysore. His previous culinary experiences include working as a mixologist, working with bread and pastry, and since his foray into chocolate making in 2012, his company is one of the first chocolate makers in the world to use organically certified Indian cacao beans exclusively, as well as the first bean to bar chocolate house in India. And I'm really excited to have you on here, David. Thank you so much for making time for this. Thank you, Sanchi. It's a pleasure to be here. Pleasure's all mine. Thank you once again. So, David, can you just, for everyone who loves eating chocolate, but of course doesn't know what goes on in the process behind it, can you just walk us through the process of making chocolate? Oh, wow. Uh, From scratch. So, I mean, obviously, (laughs) uh, chocolate comes from the cacao or the theobromida cacao plant. We use the seeds from the fruits. So it is a fruit. The seeds are fermented. And um, once they're fermented and dried, then it comes to us. They're dehusked, which is quite a process actually. And uh, from being dehusked, then they, they break down by themselves. They, they, they kind of break into small fragmented pieces called cacao nibs. And then there's a process of changing the mechanical nature of the nib, i.e. grinding basically yeah, from a solid to a liquid releasing all the natural oils, the fats, aka cocoa butter, in, in the nut, and then conching, which is a process of evaporating volatiles and acids, uh, mellowing out the flavor and oxidization. And then after conching, we get chocolate. So that's what a French uh, patissier would call couverture, which means coating as the base chocolate. And then the chocolatier work is working with the chocolate, adding ingredients, flavors, etc., and then molding it up into different shapes crystallizing it into a solid form and then packaging it. Yeah. I mean, that sounds like quite a long and extensive process. And so can you just tell us what bean to bar means? Because I know that that's what Naviluna specializes in. So if you could just explain how that fits into the longer process, that would be great. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, let's use the the French culinary terms here because, I mean, they've kind of created very strict career paths within the kitchen. So a chocolatier or a person who works with chocolates um, in the French tradition is a person who buys in chocolate couverture or or cacao liquor or cacao paste. They're interchangeable words, but that just means like basically chocolate mass. And then they will, you know, use their creative skills to kind of season it or add different ingredients or whatever. Um, and they're molded into different shapes, whether that's, you know, Easter bunnies or chocolate bars or praline or bonbons, mm-hmm. et cetera. Bean to, bean to bar means that we start all the way back with a cocoa bean. So what we're really doing is what the French would call being a couverture or a couverture maker. So we're actually making the chocolate, right? So this is more akin to winemaking and a lot less akin to, you know, a pastry. So we're working with terroir, we're working with provenance. We're looking at how the cacao from a certain origin, you know, what its flavor profiles are, how to bring out some of the flavor profiles that we enjoy um, and how to diminish some of the ones that we don't. So it's quite an involved process. But I think definitely the, the easiest parallel for people to draw is, is winemaking where, you know, you've got a, a base ingredient, you've got provenance, you've got terroir, 
And then you've got the influence of the maker or the chocolate maker for us. So it's great the end result. Yeah. And I mean, it's interesting that you decided to choose India because as I explained and as I described earlier, that Naviluna is one of the few chocolate making companies that are focused on using Indian cacao beans. And I think it's quite commonly known that West Africa, particularly Ivory Coast and Ghana, uh, produces two thirds of the world's cocoa. So what drew you to India? I mean, why did you choose to decide that, you know, you're going to set up Naviluna in India? That's a great question. Um, Obviously, it's not something that I decided. India just, you know, it was on my agenda, um, having done 11 years of London, having big city burnout. And I could just kind of see like some of my colleagues burning out. My priorities changed. They went from being very sort of career centric to being a little bit more holistic. So I'd already taken a backseat and I was looking to work less hours to have more time on my hands and explore things, you know, sort of outside my career. And uh, honestly speaking, at that point in my life, I really just wanted a scenario or an environment that, that allowed me to kind of experiment, take risks, take chances. And I was also just fed up with the weather in the UK. Uh, I'm from South Africa. So, you know, I've grown up with mangoes and good sunshine and tea and cricket. And, and I definitely wanted a bit more of that in my life. Yeah. Um, but I still had an appetite for adventure, maybe a little bit of wanderlust. So it just kind of like ticks all the right boxes. So that was really that. And then I'd really been here about six months. When, when I came, I mean, I, I mean, I was baking a lot before I came. And uh, I was kind of, you know, keen to do a food project, not, not really sure what to do. And then one fine day, a friend that I'd met in my store produced these cocoa beans. And I was like, yo, where did you get that? And she was like, I got them in Gokana. You know, the locals gave them to me. So then immediately started doing research, discovered that, you know, the, the West Coast, the, the, the Malabar Coast, um, that has Arabian Sea, grows loads of cocoa there, Kerala predominantly, uh, did more research and then discovered that Anasca has cacao, uh, subsequently Tamil Nadu, et cetera, and all the Southern States. I had no idea when I first arrived. So I saw all this cocoa. Everyone was complaining about, complaining about how bad the chocolate was in India at the time. You know, Lint was like sort of setting the bar at that time, yeah. uh, no pun intended. But, you know, like <laughs> there, was, there was a lot lacking. And this was pre-Make in India. But going back to 2011, you know, this is like everything was still imported. Going to any nature's basket store at that time and everything was imported, right? Like yeah. there was no sort of like pride in like domestic produce. Yeah. So whereas like it's it's mad like now it's 2020 and it's everywhere and and i mean i kind of predicted it but you know it was such a different landscape in terms of you know what was an offer to consumers in india and i think it's really hard for guys in their sort of mid-20s guys and girls in the mid-20s to kind of realize that because they've just grown up with all this stuff and yeah at that time you know it, it all the good stuff was imported and there was very little happening domestically yeah and i think also the conversations that were being had around food just didn't include where the food was sourced from or where the food came from. And there wasn't as much as an emphasis on the provenance of what you were eating as there is now, right? I mean, today we're sort of talking about sustainability. We're talking about organic. We're talking about clean eating, GMO free. You know, we've got all of these terms, almost sometimes perhaps too many terms, you know, to get your yeah. head around. But we, that conversation just did not exist back then. Absolutely. I mean, yes, there are a lot of buzzwords and they are buzzing, but they are reflective of a much more conscious consumer and, and much more conscious eating habits in India, which, which is fantastic to see. Now, I know that your background in culinary experiences is actually bread, pastry and cocktails. <laughs> but I want to know how, how different is making chocolate to all of these different experiences that you've had? I mean, is it easy? Was it very difficult? Was it extremely challenging when you first began? Okay, so psychologists have talked about a phenomenon called the Dunning-Kruger effect, whereby the less you know of a particular subject, the more you think you know, uh, and you don't know what you don't know until you know it. I, <laughs> having done 11 years in mixology uh, and then being a bread baker and a pastry chef, I thought I was going to bring my game to chocolate and ace it. You know, I was like, oh my God, I'm going to be the best chocolate maker in the next you know, two years. <laughs> I'm going to be uh, the be I, best chocolatier in India. <laughs> I was the poster boy for the Dunning-Kruger effect or for Stockholm <laughs> Syndrome. You know, I, oh my God. And I didn't even really start tasting chocolate properly until about three or four years in. I mean, I, I tasted a little bit, but like I was like really in my own world. I mean, I was studying, but I, I wasn't sort of comparing uh, the chocolate that we were making at that time to what was out there, you know? 
And I had a very strong set of principles, you know, around production style and about recipes and ingredient choices. But, and actually, you know, we've pretty much stuck to that um, for the last eight years. But yeah, wow, man. Yeah, I've just, my chocolate making skills, my knowledge, my understanding, even my palate. My palate has always been sharp, you know, you know, training behind the bars. This is one of the, the best places to train your palate. And, you know, a trained palate to a, to a culinary professional is like a trained ear to a musician without it, you're blind, you know, and, and I talk about this to my guys all the time, my chefs, but, um, so my palate was always sharp, but I didn't really know what to taste for in cacao. When I started, honestly, I didn't even know what good cacao looked, smelled or tasted like. So, I mean, there was a huge learning curve and like, yeah, I'm lucky that I have such a strong background in food and drink and it's been 17 years, but, um, wow. You know, yeah. Chocolate was a, is, is by far the hardest thing I've ever done. Yeah. And it's interesting that sort of the conversation now around chocolate and what, not just what cho- about what chocolate is, but especially what good chocolate is, right, yeah. is always talked about in terms of the cacao percentage that the chocolate has. And is it that whenever a chocolate has a higher percentage, like I know that there's Nestle dark chocolate, which has 70% cacao in it, does that mean that it's necessarily better or that it tastes better or that, I mean, what, what does it actually an indication of? Right. Okay. So there's, I mean, this is such a great thing and, and, and life would be so simple if things were, you know, so quantifiable. Um, yeah. And the reality is that, you know, life is not quantifiable and we have to think in terms of qualities, not quantities, but going on to this question. So the first thing we need to do when we look at a percentage on a chocolate bar is to ask ourselves, is this two ingredient chocolate or three ingredient chocolate? Now what's the difference? With three ingredient chocolate, what's happened is that they've taken the cocoa bean, which naturally has fat content of about 45 to 55% fat. And cocoa fat, we we typically call cocoa butter, right? But it's just an oil, just like olive oil or or coconut oil coming Mm -hmm. out of coconut. So 45 to 55% fat. Now there's a process called dutching, which was invented at the turn of the century that basically allows you with a very high pressure hydraulic press after alkalizing the cacao nibs to actually separate the fat from the fiber, right? So those are the two constituent parts of the cocoa bean. In three ingredient chocolate, they've separated the fat from the fiber of the cocoa bean, right? Then they add sugar and then they bring the fat and fiber elements back together, but at different ratios than what nature had put them in, right? And also because of the high pressure, the shear, the high heat, the friction, and even the alkalizing process, you're losing a lot of the nutritional value when you go through the dutching process and you separate cacao uh, fiber, aka cocoa powder, which you see as, as cocoa powder on the, on the supermarket shelves, and the fat or cocoa butter. With two ingredient chocolate, there's no separation of the fat from the fiber. The, the cacao beans themselves uh, or the nibs just get ground and conched, right? So when you see that percentage, that percentage means any cocoa derivative ingredient. So even though it's a 72%, it still might be 35% cacao fat, and the remainder is the fiber. Now, the thing is the flavor and the, most of the health benefits are in the fiber, not in the fat. The okay. fat is good for your skin, et cetera. But internally, in terms of like anandamide, philothinamine, even the little bits of, of vitamin C, the high levels of magnesium, all these benefits in cacao, the antioxidants, they're all in the fiber. They're not in the fat. So it's a little bit of a misnomer when you see like Nestle or even, you know, Cadbury's Bourneville, but their fat thing is like 55% dark or something, but don't quote me on that. But, you know, these numbers don't actually tell you how much of the cocoa fiber is in there. But whereas when it's two ingredient chocolate, like ours or like a dandelion or something, then you know for a fact that, you know, there's a much higher cacao fiber content because there's no added cocoa butter. Yeah. And I know that most of the popular chocolate brands like Hershey's, Mars, Nestle, Lint as well, I think Lint is sort of considered to be the higher end or like a premium, premiumized yeah. offering of chocolate. Most of them, they don't have either two or three ingredients. They've actually got loads of ingredients on there. And does that mean that that sort of dilutes and that dilutes what their offering is and perhaps they shouldn't actually be calling themselves chocolate as much as candy? What do you think of that? Oh, <laughs> difficult. No, no, I think they should be called Chocolate, because I mean, okay. they are a predominantly cacao product, but um, we have to separate the difference between an industrial product and a boutique product and an industrial mass market product and a high end specialty product. The same way that we have a distinction between instant coffee and, you know, good Arabica. It's all coffee, right? right. Uh, but obviously, yeah, it's totally different. And one is commodity and the other one's speciality. And, I, and I, that's what, you know, we're working on a lot at Nabilumi is to educate people on the difference. 
So, so yeah, I mean, it is all chocolate, but for sure, all those additives, et cetera, they, they add another dimension to the whole thing. And they, they also make it quite addictive. You know, a lot of people are actually addicted to what they think is chocolate, but it's actually the sugar. Hmm. And how, how do you think consumer tastes have evolved during your time making chocolate and perhaps even before you got into making chocolate? Yeah, I mean, when I started, I, I was so sure that, you know, there would be a sort of health revolution in India, um, that people are going to get a lot more conscious and get off the, the vadas <laughs> and the, the dahabandas and all the rest of it and, and sort, sort of clean up the diet. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, look, they're, they're great. Make sure um, no one's going to be of, offering you any butters after this. <laughs> they need not. And my waistline doesn't need it and I don't need it. It's great pub food after a couple of beers, but I mean, it's, it's really not doing anyone any favors um, more than once a week, you know. So that's great. And to see all these sort of like um, little stores open up around Bangalore, conscious cafes and conscious restaurants and even like conscious fast food, it's been amazing. So... I did predict it and I predicted people were going to get into dark chocolate. And I knew that initially folks could get into it because of the health benefits. So sort of engaging with our chocolate on an intellectual level, not, not necessarily from their palate. Mm. It wasn't necessarily what people wanted to taste. But I also know that once you start to reduce your sugar consumption, your palate actually changes. And, you know, when I was behind the bar, I, and a lot of people don't, don't even realize this, like when I was behind the bar, if I had an American guest walk in, I knew that they had a sweeter palate than, say, a European guest. So I would balance my drinks differently. And there's a, there's a famous winemaker called Ken Jackson from California, and he kind of really brought French-style wine to the U.S. And, and again, same thing, like knowing that they had a sweeter palate, he started at 20% sugar, and then every two years brought down the percentage by 1% point. So, so it's a slowly get the American consumer into French-style wine. He kind of met them where they were, and then he kind of encouraged them towards a more traditional European style. So that's something I've been conscious of. What we've really tried to do, instead of doing what Ken Jackson did with, with playing sugar levels, is use inclusions, use fruits, nuts, interesting things like gondraj, uh, even jamun, etc., to kind of get you know bridge a gap with people and dark chocolate, and then slowly get them into the single origins and and, and sort of the purer expression of what we do. Yeah, and and Indians have a sweet tooth as well. I think Indians sort of like their flavors to be, you know, very full on of just one thing. So it's either too salty or too sweet or too spicy. How did you manage to sort of strike the balance between all of these different flavors and all of these different palettes that are out there within your chocolate? Because I know that Navi Luna has an offering which combines chili and capsicum it's got an offering that combines pineapple it's got an offering that combines with uh, chocolate with miso park so all of these are like quite <laughs> different quite dynamic and almost clashing with each other so, so so what was the sort of logic behind that i mean that's just innovation you know and yes it's very complex flavor theory but um, i mean that that is i suppose me reaching into my bag of tricks as a as a you know 11 year bartender cocktail bartender working with flavors, you know, for the past over a decade. Uh, so luckily, you know, I know how to work with those flavors. And as I say to my guys all the time, the, the ideas for those recipes is only 20% of the job and executing them and balancing them properly is 80%. I mean, it is hard. It is really, really hard. And, you know, I mean, that just comes with, with years and years of tasting and, and, and developing flavor theory that, you know, is similar to a painter to live in color theory uh, and then knowing how to work with different colors. So it's the same kind of thing. But for sure, we wanted to create a surprise by creating very innovative flavors and kind of make our, make our mark as Naviluna. You know, we were never going to do hazelnut. We were never going to do mint. We still haven't, at least not, you know, simply. And I think that was really important. And then also for the international market, you know, like why would we do hazelnut, which has just been done to death in Italy when we could be doing gondraj? Yeah. I know that you work with local farmers and local producers of cocoa, but when you look at the cocoa industry at large, it is an industry that's got a lot of things that it needs to solve and it needs to address, including modern day slavery. What do you think are the most pressing issues that the industry needs to address and, and how, how do we go about doing that? This is complex. First of all, I think the issue of child slavery in cocoa, which as we know, and I'm sure most of the listeners will know, is predominantly in West Africa. Right. Cote d'Ivoire produces, Cote d'Ivoire and Ghana produce about 85% of world cocoa production. Brazil used to be number three and, until they had a huge disease that wiped out most of their cacao in the 80s. A lot of people believe that it was actually um, 
biosabotage that that, that, that virus was planted there um, by someone oh, else right. in the industry. That's interesting. Yeah, a bit of controversy there. Yeah. yeah. Um, Indonesia used to be massive. Actually, most of India's commercial crops comes from Malaysia. So Malaya uh, and, and Indonesia are, are quite big. But the slavery thing, you don't really see in Asia, right? It's mainly in West Africa. Now, Cote d'Ivoire almost went back into another civil war three years ago. Yeah. It's highly politically unstable. Ghana, you know, I haven't spent much time there. I mean, I actually, uh, correct myself, I haven't spent any time there, but I'm not so up to date with sort of current affairs over there. But I know that, you know, they've had strong currency devaluation nonstop since independence. They've had some relative stability in governance, but, you know, they've also had a couple of coup d'etats. And, you know, Ghana, one of the biggest industries is the recycling of computer parts for scrap. I mean, they, they, I think they're struggling as a country. I know they've got a fantastic uh, prime minister at the moment, but um, I think most of these issues are much more macroeconomic and they're not actually specific to the cacao industry. That's the point I want to make. And I, and I think it just gets affected by cacao because those are very important national crops in, in those uh, crops to their economies in, in those countries, because we don't see the same thing in Latin America. We don't see the same thing in Asia. So, so yeah, I think it's very much uh, an issue that, that, that's in West Africa. Yeah, and it's interesting that there's also slated to be this increased, almost an exponential demand in the chocolate and cocoa industry. It's expected to reach almost $67 billion by 2027. And it's mostly driven by this high demand for premiumized offerings. And there's this growing awareness on the bean-to-bar concept and, and perhaps even on the issues within the cocoa industry. What are your thoughts on this increased demand? Do you think this is encouraging? Do you think it's, it's a good thing that people are getting to know about how their chocolate is made? Or do you think it's just that they're getting on board at a superficial level where perhaps companies have just managed to greenwash their products well? Right. Okay. Um, I don't personally think that um, most of this demand is being driven by speciality. And, and I'll tell you why. So if you compare other similar, let's, let's call them sister industries, so craft beer as a percentage of all beer sales is 20%. Specialty coffee as a percentage of all coffee sales is 14%. Specialty chocolate as a percentage of all chocolate sales is less than 1%. All right. So yeah, yeah. And those are, those are figures that, that were published last year. So no, specialty chocolate is such a tiny, tiny dot in the chocolate ocean. Most of the increased demand is coming from increases in India with you know, more people entering the, the middle class and consumption habits is changing, and China. Um, and the fact that, you know, these two sort of very populous countries are getting online with, with chocolate is, is driving up the demand. And there is apparently, according to articles I've read, a sort of a slow but steady substitution from traditional metais to industrial chocolate in rural India. So I think that is what's really pushing the demand more than anything. And also Africa. I mean, we have to remember that, you know, Rwanda is doing really well. It's growing. Um, Nigeria has grown exponentially in the last 10 years. So, I mean, they, they now have the biggest economy in Africa and they have a very large population. So I think what's happening is that a lot of countries with large populations, a lot of people are entering the middle class, their spending power is increasing and, and chocolate is just kind of one of the commodities that um, become part of a new, a new lifestyle. But, it, but it's industrial chocolate, it's mass produced chocolate, we're not, we're not talking speciality. Right. You know, that, that's sort of different to what perhaps the, is the clientele that you're looking to address. Are you looking to reach out to people who are actually entering in this market or are you looking to reach out to people who are actually, well, I don't really like this term, but I'm just going to use it for the point of this question, quote unquote, chocolate purists. Right. No, great question. So, I mean, our whole thing at Nabiluna is to live well, right? Live well is Nabiluna's slogan and also our uh, mission statement. And that's, that's in every way, you know, and we just use chocolate as our platform to encourage living better. So, of course, we are targeting those who share those values, who want to live better, who are looking at life more holistically rather than, you know, sort of in a binary way. You know, of course, our, our sort of target demographic are sort of educated and, and well exposed, etc. But here's the thing. The reason why is you, you always find that innovation starts at the edges, and innovation always starts with people who are willing to look beyond the status quo. So you always have to target, before you make any kind of sea change, you need to target a certain demographic for that to happen. What I would love to do at Nabiluna with speciality chocolate in the medium to long term is to do what craft beer did for beer and basically up the game. Because if, if we can 
get more value in the market and we can bring chocolate into people's lives in areas where they didn't even think chocolate belonged, i.e., you know, someone before going to the gym or before going to a yoga or a Pilates class, realizing the health benefits of chocolate and how it actually can help them training or at the office as like a 4 p.m. pick me up or as a study companion, like because chocolate works in all these areas, but industrial chocolate has no place there. So we're, we're creating new areas for chocolate in people's lives by reinterpreting what chocolate is. If we can successfully do that and we can, we can get better value in the market for chocolate, then we can carry that value back down the supply chain and give it to farmers. And then that can start to spread out. And that can be a system that we can even uh, apply to save more mass market genres of chocolate. But it's very, very difficult to create a sea change at the mass level by yourself as a startup. It's, it's virtually impossible. You have to start small. You have to be very clear about who your target, who your audience is, uh, and then go from there. And, and, and craft beer did really, really well, especially if you look at craft beer in San Francisco in the early 2000s, specialty coffee, uh, mainly in the States again. These things all started really, really small, and they've just grown, 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 grown slowly, but exponentially. I think one of the really compelling things about Navi Luna, mind you, I actually haven't tasted your chocolate yet because every time no. I go on your website, it's all sold out. It's um, not all sold out. It I have is to all fix sold this. Out. It monsoon is collection. <laughs> so you need to go to the monsoon collection, okay? Because right. everything else is out. But the monsoon collection, we, we had to cut our menu back during because of the lockdown. Um, right. So the mon- just for everyone listening, the monsoon collection, go there. That's what's available now. It's raining, it's monsoon. That's the collection. Okay, well, I wanted to try the other chocolate, but that was sold out. Right. And essentially, the most compelling thing about Navi Luna, right, is its design. So every time I go on your website or your Instagram feed, one of the most sort of alluring things about it is just how beautiful it is to look at. And what was your thought process behind that? Why was design such a key concept to Navi Luna's offering besides chocolate? I mean, that, that really, you know, I, I really try not to, to take up the limelight and, and push my, my team forward. But I, I must say that that's really me as a storyteller. Our design language is the language that I use and the vehicle that I use to tell a story. And since day one, and since we started in 2012, my whole premise was to reinterpret a picture of India, both for India and for the world. You know, we live in Mysore. They have the Mysore Palace down the road. I can, I can see it from my, my bedroom window. There's a lot of glamour here. And I just feel like sort of the age of Mother Teresa in Calcutta, with kids eating rats off the streets and whatever, that I was fed when I was in school. The India that I grew up with in my imagination, I, I think, yeah, it's valid, of course. Um, it's a diverse country and there's a lot of narratives. But I also think some of the glamour has been missing from the domestic and international narrative of what this country is. And I think there's so much richness that just needs to be shared you know and you can only share what you focus on so i've been very specific about the the design language and the visual language that we've used to kind of just you know portray these values and share them and did you get this inspiration just by your time in in mysore and your time in india overall or or were you like you know you're just sitting around one time and then just saw that chocolate innovation and chocolate design had just peaked at toblerone no pun intended. Um, and, and then you were just like, oh my God, this is all that they've got going in there for them in the design section and I need to completely revamp this. Not at all, not at all. Um, I, you know, I've always loved sort of Cuban architecture and contemporary Renaissance architecture. There's a, there's a better word for that. But I love the indo sassanic architecture, which is obviously the style that you see most of in Mysore. The Woodyard dynasty did a lot of construction in the 1920s. And I always thought that Mysore was kind of the Havana of South India. Um, so yeah, that, that design, yeah, the design language just came, came about from that. You know, you've got touches of sort of Bombay, Art Deco in parts of the city as well. So I just kind of absorbed all of it, just walking the streets of Mysore and, and taking the city in. And I think that's, that's what attracted me to stay here and what's kept me here all these years. So yeah. there's that. And then I think, yeah, it's been coupled with the fact that, look, I, I do come from the gourmet end of the spectrum, right? Um, as a bartender, I was working in gourmet. I, you know, was freelancing for Diageo and Pernod Ricard. Um, I was working with some of the luxury brands. I used to run the VIP at the Cafe de Paris, where we're, you know, we're dealing with vintage champagnes and vintage wines, uh, cigars at the Boisdell and Canary Wharf in London. So I've always been in gourmet. And I think I've brought some of that approach and that visual language to what I do and then just kind of integrated that with, with what I see in my soul. And I think London, having worked in London, I mean, I myself have lived in London, so I was sort of exposed to like 
this very edgy, very contemporary way of doing things. I mean, not that I was doing anything in the kitchen, but I was just <laughs> consuming. But I was like, ooh, I really like this edgy way of plating up my meal or the cocktail. That I thought it was quite experimental in its gastronomical scene, right? And yeah. do you think that that was also influential in sort of shaping your perception of design and shaping your perception of what something can look like or what its potential is? The two kind of opposing forces in our design language at Navi Luna is that like edginess that you just spoke about, which is very London centric, it may be very New York centric as well, versus the sort of classic sandalwood, um, jasmine in her hair, South India that I draw a lot from. So yeah, those are definitely the two things. And even how we operate, we're quite London, quite edgy. You know, I, I'm an ex-skateboard uh, for, you know, I used to skate in, in South Bank in London. And uh, there's kind of like a punk rock DIY attitude that comes with all of that yeah. um, and breaking boundaries. And, and sometimes it's been beneficial in India. And then sometimes it's, you know, you, you, know you, you do rub people up the wrong way. But at the end of the day, you know, it's, it's, it's your style and it's your approach to things. And you just kind of, kind of, you've got to be authentic to yourself. So yeah, I mean, London, Jesus, it's such a great school to teach you how to do things and teach you how to think out the box. And like, yeah, I think that the thing about London is that like, it's so competitive, but in a non-destructive way, it's in a constructive way, right? Like people will do something in, in your field and then they'll show you and they'll be like, okay, now what have you got next? You know, like they're yeah. asking you to one up them yeah. because they know that it kind of builds the industry overall. And in my day behind the bar, you know, like London was way ahead of New York. You know, there was like maybe three or four really good cocktail bars in New York for every 10 in London. Paris wasn't even on the map. Tokyo was like just, just being discovered. So I think it's that, that kind of constructive competition, which, you know, in India, I find, I find a lot of times like people feel that the best way to have the, the tallest building in the, in the room, or well, sorry, the tallest building in the city is to tear up down everyone else's building. Uh, and the reality is that actually you should just build the tallest building. It's much better. Um, and yeah. the new industry comes up. So, I mean, it's, it's not easy. We all get insecure, but um, it's something that we all have to be quite mindful of. I remember that every weekend that I would sort of go for a walk in a new area, it would just be that there'd be so many different pop-ups. There'd be so many newer, smaller businesses who were constantly, you know, upping the game, like you said, and they would be sort of at the forefront of doing the same thing, but completely differently, you know, in a similar industry, we're doing it completely differently, very innovatively. And I think that was the exciting part about it, as opposed to what you were actually selling or what you were actually providing. It was how you were doing it that then mm. caught the attention. Absolutely. You know, the, the how is everything. And, uh, and I think that's synonymous. Like, I think that's true everywhere. And I just think that in London, people got that a long time ago. And it's one of the reasons why you know, a lot of people have made themselves there. Yeah. And we're talking a little bit about perception, but when we talk about luxury and artisan and, and, we, and we have all of these sort of very specific mental images that pop up in our mind, is the engraving on the chocolate bar, apart from, you know, the design and uh, the design of the paper and the wrapping itself, is that an attempt to impart a sense of luxury as well to sort of fit into the artisanal chocolate model? beyond the fact that you obviously already do things very differently to rest of the players in the cocoa industry? I mean, uh, it's interesting. Luxury wasn't really the idea behind the, the engraving on the mold. That style is Kuchitara, which comes from the Western Ghats, which is where the first farms that we started to work with are, are situated. So the idea there was using folk art and, and culture to kind of bridge the consumer with the farmer. And sort of the whole thinking behind that was like, Kind of felt that there's a huge gap between you know the raw agricultural products what comes from the land and what you see on the supermarket shelf you know which is packaged and branded and got a corporate budget behind it etc so I, I wanted to use the folk art and, and culture and tradition to kind of just bridge that gap and of course it's subliminal a lot of people will have no idea but i'd like to think that there's all these sort of hidden messages built into the Navaluna products that that translate meaning um, and some people get it and some people don't what is your response to people who would say, for instance, that Naviluna chocolate is expensive as opposed to, you know, all the other chocolates that are out there? Great question. Um, so I was listening to a farmer the other day, US-based, and he was, he was saying that in the US, in the 1970s, on average, people spent, I mean, I forget the numbers, but basically more money on food and less money on medicine and exactly in uh, inverse proportions, people are spending 
uh, that amount of money on medicine and less money on food today because food has become so cheap. Um, so just bringing it back, yeah, the industrialization of food has made it artificially cheap. Right. And the true cost gets offset and it usually gets offset on, on your health and your lifestyle and, and even your mental health, you know. And I think what we're really seeing is that you know, what, what we're doing, of course, we do not have the economy of scale of, of an industrial brand like Lint, right? I mean, let me just put this in perspective for people. When Lint delivers chocolate, right, from one facility where they make the curvature to the other facility where they make the bars, they take a, like a petrol truck, right? Like what you see, a petrol or like a milk truck. Um, and then the chocolate is in there and it gets piped into the, into the factory, right? So we're talking huge levels of industrial production, we are doing something on an utterly different scale, a tiny, tiny scale. So obviously we don't have the luxury of the economy of scale to do that, number one. Number two, we pay our young chefs three times minimum wage, okay, uh, in the state of Karnataka. I know of other chocolate makers who are paying below minimum wage. And of course, I'm not going to mention any names, but that is a concern. So, you know, we have these higher prices because we believe that people should be paid well, you know, and we, we are demanding of our team. We demand excellence. So, you know, they have to be paid accordingly. The other cost is branding. You know, we, we are doing a lot of branding and a lot of education to create a new subgenre within the chocolate industry. So that costs money. We don't need the economy of scale, as I mentioned before. And we're paying farmers 150% minimum above the nationally or, or the government set um, commodity price. And we pay a fixed price. We don't fluctuate with market highs and lows. So sometimes, you know, for example, there'll be a bumper crop in West Africa, then global prices will go down and we could use it at a point of, as a point of leverage to bargain with farmers and get them to bring their prices down. We don't do that. In fact, we, we really make an effort to just keep prices stable. And then what we ask farmers in return is to keep their quality stable. That's, that's the only thing. So we have a lot of costs. We don't have much scale. And so I think when you take that into consideration, what we give is very cheap. And another thing that people forget to realize is that 50% of our margins actually goes to the retailer. So we're not even pocketing um, the MRP, you know, far from it. So yeah, there, there's a lot of costs that you don't see. And then if you compare a bar of, you know, Nabaluna to say a bottle of wine, you're talking 390 rupees MRP, 390 to 1200 rupees, 1,500 for a decent bottle of wine. Like, so, I mean, I think, you know, for what it is, it's, it's very well priced. Yeah, and I think you put it really well that because of the level of industrialization um, in almost every field, not just, I mean, we're talking about food, we're talking about chocolate, but if you look yeah, at, look at fashion, in general, look at fashion, your fashion, fast, yes, fast fashion exactly. In Bangladesh. Fashion. Yeah. And, you know, I don't know if you um, know about this documentary, but it's recently come out. It's called, uh, what is it? It's in looking into the shop, the fast fashion uh, brand Misguided in the UK. And it's literally like people are just saying that, you know, this is, this is a very misguided brand because in the show itself, there's an episode where one of the team members from Misguided is speaking to someone, the, the manufacturer, their supplier in China, and they're trying to drive the price down from £7.40 to even lower, right? And the thing is that we're so used to buying things cheap or we're so used to sort of expecting them to come cheaply to us. We don't actually factor in the fact that there's material costs, there's maker costs, there's shipping costs, there's all of these different costs that are just not, you know, accounted for. And of course, the worst Absolutely. thing is that in this episode as well, there's this contestant from Love Island, <laughs> the reality show in the UK, and she gets offered to like as much as compensation to collaborate with Misguided, she gets offered three hundred and fifty thousand pounds plus a Range Rover when she doesn't even know how to drive. So you know, it's not even like sometimes I think what the issue is that people assume that you know it's consumers who want this and all, or that they, maybe brands don't have money. But it's actually just that brands do have that money, but they would rather just you know invest it within themselves, invest it in themselves, keep the profits for themselves instead of actually paying a fair living wage. Yeah. And I think also what needs to happen is that consumers need to get a little bit more savvy with where value perception lies for them. You know, where we perceive value is really, really important. A Supreme t-shirt costs you 25 quid or maybe $25 in the store, but the resale value can go up to a thousand, right? Why? Because there's a value perception along the resale chain. So, and, and I mean, that's what brands have traditionally done really well. But like, we know that if I buy like a Louis Vuitton bag, for example, there's a certain level of design there. There's a certain level of qualities and of materials that have been used in that design and various other factors. So there's value perception. 
that is where we as Naviluna and as and all our sister brands, you know, like Mason and Co and, and uh, Pascati and Mike and Becky, whatever here in India, we all have to make a very clear distinction between speciality chocolate and commodity chocolate, right? They are two different value propositions to the market. So they're not the same thing. The same way that, you know, you can go down the road now and get a Tetra Pak bottle of inverted commas whiskey, which is not even whiskey, um, it's sugar cane. I didn't even know they right? had that. <laughs> It is shocking. I, the right. moment I saw spirit being sold in Tetra Packs, I was, I, was, I was scared. But they were preparing us for the lockdown, don't you know? <laughs> <laughs> Great foresight. <laughs> State of Kerala has done very well. Yeah. Um, you know, we, we can't go, you know, the value proposition of that, which is basically to get, you know, slammed versus a Lagavulin is not the same thing, but they are both whiskey. So Value is really a matter of perception. And I think the more savvy consumers become in terms of where and how they perceive value, you're going to get better quality brands who are actually doing, you know, a sustainable job. And going back to fast fashion, you know, you're talking about driving down the price and, you know, there's a cost of material and there's a cost of logistics and there's a cost of energy and fuel to get those things shipped around the world and whatever. What about the cost of employee liability insurance if something goes wrong? You know, because if someone gets their hand stuck in a machine, that's their livelihood gone forever. What about, you know, if, if, if you know, a traditional family and, you know, the, the, the male is the, is the breadwinner and, and something happens to him or all these other sorts of safety nets, which developed countries have more of, like those are all costs too. And they come out of a company's pocket. They come out of the, the product. So if you keep on driving down prices, driving down prices, you can't then get on your soapbox and start preaching, you know, for a more equitable society because it's just not going to happen. There's no money for it. Yeah. And just to add to that point, I just wanted to share this statistic because I came across it and I was just like, wow, you know, so 400 cocoa beans equal one pound of chocolate. So that's how many cocoa beans it takes to make one pound of chocolate. And for reference, right, a Hershey's chocolate bar weighs 1.55 ounces and there are 16 ounces in a pound. So that means that 10 Hershey's bar equals one pound of chocolate. And each bar then has around 40 cocoa beans going into it. And does that mean then that, you know, is that why adulteration of that chocolate with all of these different things happens as well, just to sort of like produce chocolate at this scale? Because, you know, obviously nature is not able to churn out cacao beans at the level at which this industry wants it. Mm. It is actually, but it depends how you go about things. Obviously, the way cocoa is grown in West Africa, which like we said, is 85% of the world's cacao, is not grown in a sustainable way. It's monocropped to start with, which obviously depletes soil uh, nutrients. Then cacao is a jungle plant, right? So it needs to be shade grown. And typically what you'll see in Ghana and Ivory Coast is that um, the cacao is grown under the full glare of the sun. Um, It's not grown under the shade. And that's very different to what we see here in Asia. And that's across that South Asia and Southeast Asia, where you have a lot of biodiversity in cacao orchards and then cacao gets into crops quite, quite well over here. So it's a very different scene in, in Asia to West Africa. But yeah, the, the agricultural practice is definitely a problem, but they can be improved. Now, Brazil's cacao production has dipped massively. They could pick up if they wanted to. Uh, Indonesia could pick up if they wanted to. So, and India produces less than point less than 0.3% of the world's cacao. And there's plenty of land that, that, that is viable for cacao. So no, no, we can produce the cacao. The, the thing is that industrialization is a mindset and it was a movement. And I think it, it, it had some benefits, but like all things, you know, in, in, there needs to be moderation. And I think we've gone to the end of that experiment. We've gone too far one way where, you know, everything is just too cheap and too standardized. And, and I think we just need to come back and find a balance of industrialization. What are the initiatives or policies or campaigns that you'd like to see in particular that, you know, work towards holding current chocolate giants accountable or work towards, you know, sort of cleaning up their act, so to speak, in their supply chains? Oh, wow. You know, so I am really kind of hesitant when it comes to finding like one large entity and expecting them to change. And I really do think that we all need to change as individuals. And I think the reality is that we need to clean up our act as consumers, first and foremost, not necessarily in terms of like sustainability and ethical purchasing, though that of course is, is very important. The reality is that the stuff is not good for your health, right? So if you're cleaning up your, your consumption habits in terms of and putting your well-being first, the rest will all fall into place. There will be no impetus to create that sort of chocolate and it won't be sustainable to produce it at those low, low prices. So prices will have to come up. 
And we might even see, you know, sort of, I think decentralization is, is the antithesis to industrialization. I think it's the balancing act. And I think it is a trend that we were seeing everywhere. And I think instead of having like three multinational main chocolate giants, i.e. Cadbury's slash Montelez, Nestle and Hershey's, we've pretty much had an oligopoly for the last hundred years. I think we're going to just see a lot smaller players, regional players, you know, local bean to bars in every city, the same way that, that, that craft beer kind of changed the beer landscape. So does that mean, and I, I mean, I ask this question to almost all of the entrepreneurs I have on here and the answers I always get are very interesting. But So does that mean that sustainability is incompatible with scalability? No, there is a sweet spot. There is an equilibrium for sure. And I, and I think it's the holy grail for every artisanal or boutique entrepreneur. Because also if, if our volume of outputs is too low, we are not financially sustainable, right? We can't keep going. So we need to read a certain level of scale. So there's a minimum viable level of scale and there's a maximum viable level of scale whereby if we surpass that, then we cease to be able to create a craft or an artisanal product. And I know, you know, sort of cigars are not great for your health, but I always look to sort of the Cuban cigar industry. There, everything is still very much hand done because they are a socialist republic. So they're pro jobs and they're not really big on machinery. The, the, the Cuban cigar industry is actually pretty sustainable. I know they have some sort of very tight government restrictions about what can and can't be done, but it's all still done by hand. They still got, you know, at a very high volume, you've got factories turning out 10 million cigars a year and all by hand and all that phenomenal levels of quality. So I think that can be replicated, but yeah, there's definitely this minimum level of viability and a maximum. And yeah, for sure, all of us sort of boutique or artisanal entrepreneurs, we're looking for that sweet spot. And hopefully once we find it, then we, you know, we don't get greedy and, and, and we can just kind of have the discipline to just stay there and, and, and not go past it. Yeah, I think that's a great response, actually. And I think my final question to you then, David, would just be if you have any tips that consumers should potentially bear in mind when it comes to buying and consuming chocolate. Not just your chocolate, any chocolate. <laughs> of course, of course, of course, of course. No, I think, you know, you always got to read the label. You always can look at the ingredients. It's really, really telling, you know, we, we are what we eat in so many ways. And the simpler the, the list of ingredients and the simpler the label at the back, the better. That's really, really key. I mean, there's all sorts of things that go into industrial chocolate that have no place being there. They're just there to make it, you know, cheaper and easier to do. So that, that's, I think, start with the ingredients because reality is that, and the price, actually, don't be a cheap ass. Like at the end of the day, if you're paying $2.50 or £2.50 or you know, even 50 rupees for a bar of chocolate, something has gone wrong at the end of the day. If I take you to Cocoa Farms in Kerala or Karnataka, who sell directly to Cadbury's and Montelais, if you see some of the practices there, it is shocking. It's absolutely shocking. You know, you're talking about mold growth on the cocoa beans, slaty, chalky beans that, you know, should be thrown out, etc. Farmers adding extra water to increase the weight of the cocoa, which then invites more mold and bacterial growth. Et cetera, et cetera. And by the time they've roasted it and they've added tons and tons of sugar, you wouldn't be, you know, you're not, you're not the wiser. So there, there is always a cost and it's either going to, you know, affect your wallet or it's going to affect some, somewhere else, but there's no such thing as a free lunch. Yeah, I think that's great. And, and I'm sorry, I know I said that that was going to be my last question, but actually I just wanted yeah. to ask this, have your farmers tried the chocolate that you make? And if they have, <laughs> what do they think of it? <laughs> yeah. I mean, we've given it to, to a couple Actually, one of the people that we work with is, is not a farmer. Uh, they're a post-harvest processing specialist. They, they, they specialize in the fermentation and the post-harvest processing of cacao. So they work with the farmers. We've given it to them. I don't know if they've given it to the farmers, but there is another farming uh, a cacao estate that we, we work directly with. And I've given it to um, sort of the head of the family who's the head planter there. He hates it. I mean, he's a traditional Mangalorean. Um, he loves all of his sweets. He loves his metais. He triple fries his chak fruit in sugar syrup. So, but what he likes about it is that, you know, obviously if you've got very high percentage cocoa, then we're spending more money on cocoa and less money on sugar. So it's, it's good for his bottom line. Uh, so he loves it from that perspective, but <laughs> it's too nouveau. It's too out of, you know, the status quo from what he's grown up with. So yeah. it, this is really with the young generation. But on that point, I just want to say, those who are sort of between 21 and 26, we are seeing, they, they gravitate to what we do immediately. Uh, and that's really, really interesting. There's no second thought with them. So palettes have changed. There's definitely an evolution. Yeah, definitely. No, I think... I think it's just this evolution and I think this growth as well in understanding the intersections at which whatever you consume emerge from or whatever you consume is produced from, you know, so it's not just 
the product itself, I think there's this growing awareness of that you're, you're sort of opting in or buying into an experience. So you want to make sure that you're not doing it at the expense of someone else's well-being. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's so hard to remember that, you know, but I think the more we just practice that sort of level of consciousness, the more natural it becomes. Yeah, definitely. David, thank you so much for being on here. It's been an absolute pleasure chatting to you about all things chocolate. I wish I had some chocolate now, right now, but I don't. Um, So I'm going to go on and order some immediately from the Monsoon Collection. Thank you for that clarification, by the way. (laughs) My pleasure. Thank you very much. It's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much, David. description. If you have any feedback, suggestions, requests, or simply just want to get in touch with us, then please do head over to our podcast website. We are available to flag and say hi to via Facebook, Instagram, or email. Thank you and see you next week.